The human dissection in Bologna was about to begin. The anatomist made a vertical cut down the front of the corpse. A horizontal incision followed on either side of the navel. Pulling back skin, fat, and muscle, he, he revealed to the large audience the stomach, the liver, and the intestines. Candles and torches emitted smoke and a light that glimmered off the wood paneled walls. The flickering light did little to warm up the cold but noble room. The low temperature helped preserve the body. Near the marble dissection table rested the necessary tools. Razors, hooks, drills, paring knives, bowls, and sponges to soak up blood. Musical accompaniment added to the somber mood. Nearby, a Catholic mass was said for the soul of the criminal whose body lay open on the table. The mass stipend paid by the anatomy professor. Meanwhile, piece by piece, the professor presented parts of the body to the gaze of the onlookers seated in a circle all around, as in a theater. He showed them the brain, the organ of the age of reason, viewed as the seat of the soul, the source of the self, and at the time, the symbol of rationalized religious devotion. In the audience sat the Archbishop of Bologna, Prospero Lambertini, 1675 to 1758. He would become Pope Benedict XIV in 1740, the greatest pope of the 18th century, the Enlightenment Pope. He cultivated the public persona of a science, of a, a science patron. As archbishop of the city of his birth, he often accompanied to the scaffold criminals condemned to a double punishment, execution and dissection. He heard their confession and prayed with them. The dissection usually began after sunset on the same day. Anatomy is the science concerned with the bodily structures of organisms, especially as revealed through the separating the parts for analysis. During Lambertini's time, this was the Archbishop of Bologna again, anatomy was the master scientific discipline for the study of life. Lambertini became Pope Benedict XIV. Lambertini's strong support for the public anatomy events demonstrated the type of Catholic Enlightenment agenda he had in mind. He created the first chair of surgery in Bologna in 1742 and donated surgical tools to its occupant. One of the requirements was to perform 40 lessons per year in human anatomy in, in Bologna's two main hospitals. Thus, he called on Bologna's pastors to persuade their parishioners to donate their bodies for dissection after death. He created the first chair of obstetrics in the city concerned with childbirth and the care of women giving birth. Up stipulated in the appointment, this person would regularly give hands-on lessons to midwives and surgeons using both teaching texts and three-dimensional obstetric models. Lamartini aimed to raise surgery and obstetrics to a higher position of honor in medicine. These fields were traditionally looked down upon at the time because they involved the mechanical arts of hands-on technique. But the spirit of the Enlightenment desired to join the theoretical to the practical for the sake of public health and disseminating knowledge. And Pope Benedict XIV picked up on that. He pursued medical modernization as both archbishop in Bologna and as pope in Rome. So this presentation is about how Pope Benedict XIV believed that employing art, science, and history for the public good would help make Christian faith relevant to the people of his age. In this, he is a great example of what scholars have increasingly been calling the Catholic Enlightenment. In the work of scholars such as Ulrich Lehner, Christopher M. S. Johns, and many others, the Catholic Enlightenment is reshaping the way we think about the Enlightenment of the 18th century and the different kinds of varieties and the different relationship between the Enlightenment and religion than has often been thought of. 
Now, Pope Benedict was widely admired around Europe and not just by Catholics. The Protestant writer and politician Sir Horace Walpole, for example, wrote a famous dedication to the pontiff that went like this. Beloved by papists, esteemed by Protestants, a priest without insolence or interest, a prince without favorites, a pope without nepotism, an author without vanity, in short, a man whom neither wit nor power could despoil. So this gives some indication of Pope Benedict's international reputation for wit, charm, and genius. His moderate temper, his stand against nepotism and playing favorites, and his remarkable breadth of intellectual interests greatly impressed elites across Europe. He was also friends with Ludovico Mortori, perhaps the greatest representative of the Catholic Enlightenment. So Mortori was a priest and historian, an archivist as well. He discovered the Muratorian Fragment, the oldest known list of New Testament books from around 170 AD. He wrote the widely read bestseller Science of Rational Devotion in 1747. He wrote against externalized and superficial and superstitious devotions that some Catholics practiced at that time and still do. Muratori argued that faith and reason need to purify each other in moderate forms of devotion oriented toward God and service to neighbor. He demonstrated in this book careful boundary thinking, which is the phrase I use to describe carefully distinguishing temporal from spiritual matters. Muratori held that the church should not lord over the peoples of the world, but serve them, including non-Catholics. And Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, his friend, agreed. Benedict said once, quote, I like to leave the Vatican lightnings asleep. The sovereign lawgiver, whose interpreter and vicar I am, never once made fire fall from heaven, and he lived surrounded by heretics and unbelievers. Now, Benedict was a great coffee drinker, as were many people during the age of enlightenment. The coffee house came to symbolize a new sort of public sphere that's more open and free, not controlled by either church or state, but a kind of place where people can come and freely speak about most things, at least, and in an informal way. And Benedict picked up on this spirit and loved it. And he continued to, to sort of revel in the coffee house spirit, even as Pope, in which he wanted to promote a culture of discussion, exchange, and informality. So he built his own, the Caféus, in 1744, pictured here. Benedict went here nearly every day to conduct his business. He was able to achieve much, one biographer wrote, by making people laugh. Laughter involved a certain detachment from emotional issues and a flash of common feeling between those amused together. As such, the Caféus became a key site of Catholic Enlightenment discussions about modern ideas and administrative reform in the Papal States. Now, if you were to walk in that front door there of the Caféus, you would see on the ceiling this painting, along with others, of course, Landscape with the Good Samaritan inside the Caféus. Now, the story pictured here, of course, is of the, quote, heretic Samaritan from the, from the Orthodox Jewish point of view in the time of Jesus, right? The heretic Samaritan who did the right thing. He took care of the stranger, whereas the priest and the priestly assistant failed to do the right thing. This is this kind of almost subversive story that Jesus told. And it was particularly beloved by Catholic Enlightenment figures like Pope Benedict the Fourteenth and Muratori, because it showed that Catholics do not have a monopoly on virtue. So it emphasized a kind of broad-minded, sort of almost ecumenical kind of spirit that characterized much of the Catholic Enlightenment. So this image also emphasized the naturalistic landscape and simple practical charity toward outcasts valued by Catholic Enlightenment spirituality. Now, one of the projects 
of Pope Benedict XIV, as we can see from his time in Bologna and his interest in anatomy, but all the way forward into, into Rome, where he was pope, one of his interests was in medical care. So he, he expanded and modernized this hospital in particular, Santo Spirito, to help Rome retain its global leadership in hospital care. And this was typical of Enlightenment era popes who expanded public institutions that were important to the health and welfare of the city of Rome, which of course were part of the papal states at the time. And so what we see here emerging at Santo Spirito and other advanced hospitals of this time was a new European conception of the hospital as not just a place to go to die, as the hospital had been for more than a thousand years in the West, viewed that way. We see a new conception here. We see the hospital emerging as a place where you go, yeah, sure, you could die there, but to get well, this ultimately would be the hope. And this shows really this enlightenment spirit sort of entering into these institutions, the spirit of improvement. We can, we can do better. And there were certain progressive reforms of the time that Pope Benedict XIV and others uh, within the Papal States really pushed forward. Like, for example, moving beds further apart and mandating just one patient per bed, which the, norm, the European norm at the time was, was two patients. Also, windows would be covered with glass, they would um, circulate fresh air, and the cemetery would be moved outside of hospital grounds. These were some of the reforms that uh, Pope Benedict XIV supported to help keep Roman hospitals the best in the world at the time. Another one of Pope Benedict's friends was Giovanni Lencisi here, papal physician, epidemiologist, and also an anatomist who made a correlation between the presence of mosquitoes and the prevalence of malaria. So he used to hang out with, with Benedict before he was Pope, when he was just Lambertini. Um, they used to hang out a lot together because they worked together on canonization proceedings. When Lambertini served as devil's advocate, utilizing methodical doubt as to whether someone should be formally recognized as a saint or not by the church. Right, so the devil's advocate tries to come up with all the reasons why you should not recognize somebody as a saint. And this is a really important part of the canonization process so that you don't have you know, unworthy candidates you know, come forward for sainthood. You have to have somebody who is sort of opposed to it. And, and that sort of almost check and balance uh, system there it helps to, to purify the process of canonization. Well, Lambertini served as devil's advocate for many years. And he worked with Lencisi to answer questions like this. Is a healing miraculous or could it be explained by natural causes? Because one of the requirements for canonization were miracles connected to the intercession of that person. And so the devil's advocate is to challenge those miracles. Mm, maybe they're fake miracles. We need to test them. Is this healing really miraculous or can it be explained by natural causes? Well, to answer that question, of course, you have to know a lot about natural causes. You have to know the best anatomy and medical science of the day. And while Lambertini was not himself a, a professional physician, he knew a lot about it. And he had a lot of friends who were professional physicians, and he, and he hung out with them frequently, such as Lancisi here, who was a professional physician. And Lancisi, interestingly, you know, really is a papal physician, you know, uh, a, a Catholic man for sure, but he largely set aside the classical medicine and Aristotelian natural philosophy in favor of the empirical and mechanical principles of modern scientific medicine that arose in the 17th century scientific revolution and were now spreading widely throughout society during the course of this age of enlightenment in the 1700s. Lencisi advanced this. He based his work on it in many ways. And the implication of this was that medical and philosophical questions are different kinds of questions and require different methods. So the fruit of Lambertini's work as devil's advocate and of his friendships with people like Lancisi 
The fruit of that was this great work on the beatification and canonization of saints, 1734 to 1738, that Lambertini published just before be becoming Pope. Now, here's a reminder that Christianity is a religion of empirical facts. Christians believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again as a proposition of history. They believe he now, in heaven, sees God and teaches us what he sees. That is how faith was first generated among his apostles. First, through seeing him and touching him. Later generation, generations of Christians also came to, quote, see Jesus in their own lives and through the heroic charity and suffering of witnesses, especially the saints. In other words, later generations of Christians depend on the, quote, science of the saints, a phrase that Joseph Ratzinger used in one of his books, the science of the saints. In other words, later generations of believers depend on what the saints, canonized or not, have touched, heard, and seen. Faith is not the kind of knowledge that is a private achievement. It is a gift and a participation in a community. This is where the logic of faith unfolds, Ratzinger noted, which is why, quote, faith is necessarily an ecclesial act, unquote. Faith has the character of non-autonomous knowledge, he wrote. Faith, even natural faith, in the scientific findings of other experts, for example, faith involves a factor of mutual trust, whereby the knowledge of the other becomes my own knowledge. Throughout our lives, this knowledge of faith is verified by my eyes, my mind, and the interior expectation of my heart. Ultimately, however, knowledge of God through Jesus is based on reciprocity with others. Hence, it is a powerful basis for community. Now, who are those who have seen God? The atheist Baron Dolbach asked in 1772. He was one of the great enlighteners uh, living in France who wrote against faith and God. Who are those who have seen God, he wrote. They are either fanatics or rogues or ambitious men whom we cannot readily believe upon their word. Unquote. Possibly. Possibly. Hence the need to test the words heroic virtues, and supposed miracles of those popularly believed to have, quote, seen God, particularly candidates for sainthood. They need to be tested, like witnesses in a trial case. We don't automatically dismiss witnesses just because they are witnesses. We test them. And Lambertini possessed years of experience in doing just this as devil's advocate. And the result was this book on the beatification and canonization of saints, which, interestingly, invited the enlightenment spirit of systematic doubt into one of the most intimate areas of Catholic life. And in doing so, addressed two major problems of his age. Credulity, on the one hand, which means believing too easily in miracles, and doubt, on the other hand, which wanted to dismiss the very possibility of miracles. He took a middle path between those two extremes, which is why this book became a classic, which is also why, not too long ago, in 2006, Pope Benedict XVI recognized his predecessor and namesake, the earlier, right, Pope Benedict XIV, as, quote, the master of the causes of saints. Now, the Philosopher David Hume was a great skeptic of miracles. And in his book, Essay Concerning Human Understanding, he attacked miracles as unworthy of any kind of belief. Now, note that this book, 1748, is, was published after Pope Benedict XIV's book on canonization. However, if we examine Hume's book, it still gives us an insight into a classic Enlightenment argument against miracles. So it's still worth doing, even in the context, I think, of, of Pope Benedict's work. So Hume argued that it is not reasonable to believe in miracles when relying on the testimony of others because the laws of nature 
are so certain that we would believe them rather than the testimony of someone who claims to have witnessed a miracle. Now, in response, we could say this. What if something new occurred outside one's experience of nature or the laws of nature? If one did not remain open to the possibility of mystery, to the experience of other people, science itself would cease to develop. Furthermore, someone like Pope Benedict or Lencisi or Muratori uh, would have asked Hume, furthermore, who created the laws of nature on which the natural world operates? Lambertini and his colleagues found it unreasonable to exclude almost by definition the possibility that the author of the laws of nature could choose to suspend those laws when he wills as a parent who suspends the ordinary rules of the house for a particular child in a particular case. If God could do that, then one in principle should remain open to the possibility of miracles. Benedict told a story. He recorded that one day, a Protestant Englishman visited a member of the Congregation of Rights where Lambertini was working. The member, who may have been Lambertini himself, showed this Protestant guest a dossier of evidence in support of a miracle in a canonization case. The visitor read the document attentively, Lambertini recorded, and not without pleasure. The Protestant visitor said that, quote, the evidence set forth for believing in these events was remarkable and complete. He continued, quote, if everything proclaimed by the Church of Rome were as certainly true and were based on such authentic and well-examined foundations, we should have no reason why we should not assent to it all, thus exploding all those jokes and mockeries by which your miracles are called in question, unquote. The host, who was probably Lambertini, the host replied to him, quote, but you must know that of all these miracles which seem to you to be so firmly established, not one has been approved by the sacred congregation of rites, since the proof was rejected as insufficient, unquote. Maybe even Hume would have been impressed. These rules are quite strict. Uh, they're used still to this day in kind of a modified form by the, the Lourdes Medical Bureau, for example, in France in examining you know, claims to unexplained medical healings and in canonization procedures to this day. Although it's widely recognized that these rules can't be completely 100% applied. But nonetheless, it gives us a sense for this enlightenment spirit of careful, methodical, doubtful, uh, and empirical investigation that entered into the, the very heart of the canonization process here during the Age of Enlightenment in, within the church. Now, Pope Benedict XIV did canonize saints, and here was one of them. Saint Camillus de Lely, who was a practical saint, canonized in 1746. And this classic sort of Catholic Enlightenment painting here it conveys the the kind of saints that Catholic Enlightenment spirituality really prized, ones who were practical and serving the general population around them. Right? Notice that there's no halo here, there's no um, naked baby angels like in Baroque painting sort of floating down. Um, the miraculous here is hidden. It's sort of inner. It's within the person of St. Camilli Camillus de Lely himself and motivating him right, to do what he's doing. Um, but this is a different Catholic artistic sense here than we saw in the, the previous century. It's worth noting that Camillus de Lely created the original Red Cross emblem, now used by the International Red Cross, and that there's a statue of St. Camillus de Lely in St. Peter's that was created in 1753. Another side to the empirical love of Pope Benedict XIV 
were, was his support for public museums. Now, this one was the first public museum in the world. And there, there's different ways to kind of catalog kinds of museums and who was first. But uh, there's a good case can be made that this Capitoline Museum was the first uh, public museum specifically designed as such in the world. Opened to the public in 1734 by Pope Clement XII. Now, Pope Benedict XIV generously supported the mission of this institution. And he also helped lay the foundation of the later Vatican museums. So his empirical mentality was interested in things, not just texts. Things also as vehicles of human inspiration and even supernatural faith. Also, he wanted to show the papacy as curator of Western culture. Now, Benedict remained Archbishop of Bologna even after his election to the papacy, which is kind of unusual. But he believed that bishops play a key role in mediating between faith and culture, between faith and his modern world. So he avidly supported the Academy of Sciences in Bologna, established a famous anatomy museum there, and supported the careers of learned women in Bologna as well. Really fascinating. We'll see how this works. But the Academy of Science was hailed as one of the greatest of scientific institutions in all of Italy. And he recruited the best professors and paid them well. It was designed to include an observatory, laboratories, museums, libraries, art studios, and workspaces located near each other to foster interdisciplinary creativity. One of the outstanding characters associated with this Academy of Sciences in Bologna was Laura Bassi. She was definitely one of the most remarkable women, one of the most remarkable people of the 18th century. She was a pious Catholic and mother of eight. She was the first woman in history to gain an academic chair. It was in experimental physics. She did experimental work on electricity and often lectured from home. She was one of the most influential promoters of Newtonian mechanics in Italy. And Benedict protected her career from jealous male colleagues who wanted to sideline her. In fact, she eventually secured the highest salary of any professor. There was once a Benedictine monk who visited her from Austria, and he, he left this account. Quote, I was immediately asked to come into a very nice parlor with many mathematical instruments, visiting her at, at her home. They chatted in Italian and then in Latin. I had to work really hard to keep up with her speech in Latin, he wrote. She talked so incomparably beautifully and rapidly, nevertheless sublimely, that I have to confess that I have never heard a man talk like her. This much is certain. She outdid all men I met in Italy in Latin. Another of Benedict's projects in Bologna was the famous Museum of Anatomy. It still exists. Here's a detail of one of the, the main sculptor, Ecole Lelli, one of his full-size wax-on-bone figures in the Museum of Anatomy, created by Pope Benedict XIV in Bologna. This took years to complete. A just beautiful, beautiful, haunting detail. So this, in this whole display within this museum, there were side-by-side -side anatomized bodies that would allow for systematic comparison, including between men and women. Broadening the science of man, popular during the 1700s, to include the science of women, which was generating new interest at the time. 
So that's an interesting feature. But also, these figures, these anatomized bodies, were placed within a sacred narrative, too. For example, the first two figures represented Adam and Eve. And through their visible inner turmoil, revealed the damage to the human being caused by original sin. And then the rest of the figures were anatomized further and further down beneath the skin, beneath the muscles, and all the way down to the bones. And at the end of the series, holding a scythe and sort of symbols of death, the series ended with a comment on human mortality, ultimately, as the outcome of original sin. So in this sense, the heights of art and science combined with theology, faith and facts aligned. One of the other women that Pope Benedict XIV greatly admired was Anna Morandi. He supported her career too. She lived from 1714 to 1774, raised several children, with her husband, and dissected more than 1,000 human bodies at their home in Bologna, if you can imagine this, in order to create wax models for the use of scientists, physicians, and royal courts across Europe. She even created wax models of the female reproductive system and pregnant uterus for Bologna's first school and museum of obstetrics. Now, here you can see her uh, anatomizing a human brain. This is her self-portrait uh, self of a, a bust here. She also did one of her husband, and he's anatomizing a heart. And this also was kind of subversive, because in the normal thinking of the day, men were associated with the brain and women with the heart. But she reversed that and had her husband anatomizing a heart, and she anatomizing the organ of intelligence in the age of reason. Now, there's not a lot of evidence about Anna Morandi's personal life. However, an art restorer in 1999, who was working on, the, on this bust that you can see here, an art restorer found a document tucked inside Morandi's self-portrait bust. It was a receipt showing her membership in a Catholic confraternity connected to the hospital in Bologna. This was possibly a subtle testimony to the religious faith at the center of her science. Beautiful. Wax model of hands done by Anna Morandi, 1755. The sense of touch. These, this is the symbol of the sense of touch so prized by Age of Enlightenment thinkers, the enlighteners of all different shades of religious background and things. But one of the things that united them was their fascination with sense knowledge. We find that in Locke, and then we find that all the way forward in the, the, the legacy of Newton and so many others. We can gain knowledge of the world through the human senses. So this age of enlightenment fascination with the senses she here portrays so beautifully. Just one more to give a sense of the quality of her work and of her husband and the muscles of the face. Now, much more could be said about the Catholic Enlightenment because it's such a fascinating topic. But I hope I have at least indicated some of the broad themes. Now, many factors undermined the Catholic Enlightenment by the late 18th century. One of the major causes of the end of it were the, the French Revolutionary Wars that had a devastating effect across Europe between 1792 and 1802. There were more than 200,000 military deaths and they, they, these wars spread political instability across the continent. And as pictured here, in February 1798, the French invaded the Papal States. Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner. He was escorted out of Rome and exiled in France, where he later died. This, I think, is a, a symbolic event showing the end of the Catholic Enlightenment. And because the French Revolution 
displayed such a dramatic and passionate attack on the Catholic Church, the Church has appeared ever since to many secular historians and Catholic historians um, as if it did not participate in the Age of Enlightenment at all. It has seemed in memory ever since, a post-French Revolution memory, ever since that Catholics and the Enlightenment were completely at odds with each other. As we've seen, this is not true. The Catholic Enlightenment existed, but was obscured by the trauma of later events, particularly the French Revolution. But history, the discipline of history, peers behind those later events, like the French Revolution, to see what ha actually happened before them, during the 1700s, throughout that entire century. And what happened before, one of the significant figures in those happenings was Pope Benedict XIV, who played a really important role in the Catholic Enlightenment.